Good afternoon, tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Sarah Lang and on behalf of Infrastructure New Zealand, I would like to welcome all 582 of you to our webinar this afternoon. This is our fourth webinar in a series of updates which Infrastructure New Zealand is hosting throughout the COVID-19 lockdown to keep you abreast of the changes occurring across the infrastructure sector. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by the Honourable Phil Twyford, Minister of Economic Development, Transport and Urban Development. Minister Twyford will provide an overview of government support for the infrastructure sectors from the perspective of his three portfolios before taking questions and answers from our audience later. To conclude today's webinar, the CEO of Infrastructure New Zealand, Paul Blair, will wrap up the session and discuss the next steps for the industry now, in the middle horizon, and then looking out to the longer term. This will be a crunchy 45 minute session, which we will finish up at 3.45, so do stick with us. Before we commence, for those who are not familiar with the Zoom webinar platform, I would like to run through a couple of features you might find useful. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to type your question at any stage during the presentations, and we will ask the minister as many as we can at the end of his address. Secondly, we will be recording the session today, so if you need to leave us at any stage or you would like to share the webinar with colleagues, the link to the recording will be forwarded to you later this week and uploaded onto the Infrastructure New Zealand website. Previous Infrastructure New Zealand webinars can also be found on our website. And finally, if you have found this webinar of value and are not yet a member of Infrastructure New Zealand, see the Join Us tab on our website to become a member and receive invitations to our webinars, our press releases and research thought pieces, ensuring you keep up to date on what is happening across our sector in this challenging and uncertain time. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to welcome the Minister of Economic Development, Transport and Urban Development, the Honourable Phil Twyford to join us. Minister, across to you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, uh, Infrastructure New Zealand, for uh, giving us this opportunity to talk about uh, the economy and to talk about infrastructure uh, at what I think I'm sure we all agree is a really remarkable uh, break point in New Zealand's modern history. So much has changed in such a short period of time, and um, we, we all together face, I think, enormous challenges and some opportunity in how, as a nation, we grapple with the challenge of COVID-19. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, all of you, uh, you and your companies um, for the support that the government has been uh, getting uh, for the way that we've been uh, managing the country's response to uh, COVID-19. There's no doubt that uh, it's been hugely disruptive uh, to people and their businesses. But you know, in the last few weeks, uh, as a nation, we have stayed home and saved lives. And many countries now are looking with envy at what we've been able to achieve. You will have all seen the, um, the government's uh, multi-billion dollar economic uh, response package. It's been designed to cushion the, the initial impact of the economic shock and to help keep businesses in business and workers in work. But there is more to come. And uh, in the budget in May, you'll get a, more of a sense of uh, our uh, emerging response to the economic uh, recovery. Uh, but, you know, we're right at the beginning of this thing. It's going to be with us for a while and uh, it's going to re require all of us, government, private sector, the wider community, to do things uh, differently. Let me start with four key points that I want to make, uh, and then I, I really look forward to uh, discussion and debate. The first point is that uh, infrastructure will, uh, without doubt, play a very important role uh, in the economic uh, recovery. Uh, already our government's made uh, significant efforts to put together a pipeline of work um, with the establishment of the Infrastructure Commission 
and, and the pipeline that they've been uh, putting together. You know, only uh, a few weeks ago, I announced uh, $48 billion of transport infrastructure investments through the National Land Transport Program. And then uh, some $12 billion announced earlier this year as part of the NZ Upgrade Program, which includes um, a lot of transport, but other things as well. So that's the first thing, and on, on top of that, there'll be the, um, the announcements to come uh, on how infrastructure will play its part in the recovery program and, and in economic stimulus. So that's the first point. The second is that uh, we want to take a smart approach to uh, infrastructure. Not only looking for uh, the best stimulus effect, we'll be, we're looking for projects that will create jobs, that will generate demand in the economy and keep people in work. But we also want to invest in projects uh, for a 21st century New Zealand, for the new New Zealand, not the old. And we're looking for projects uh, that are aligned with our higher goals as a, as a country. Um, for example, uh, we want projects that will support our well-being agenda. Um, Decarbonisation is one of the most important things as a country that we have to seriously grapple with uh, over the next 20 years. Um, we're looking to fix the housing crisis, something that uh, has been enormously challenging for the whole country. Sustainable land use, three waters infrastructure, the move um, to take our industries from uh, volume to value. These are all uh, incredibly important goals and we want uh, our stimulus program and the investment in infrastructure to support these higher goals. The third point really is just about context and it's to say that infrastructure uh, will sit alongside a suite of other uh, economic measures that are deployed to support the recovery. And these include industry policy. Uh, industries have, uh, there's a great deal of uh, diversity in the impact of COVID-19 on particular industries. And there are some that have been absolutely hammered uh, by the events of the last few weeks. Um, there are some industries, I think particularly our proven uh, export industries, uh, particularly the primary exporters and manufacturing, who I think have every chance of being able to come out of this in good shape and generate the jobs in the, uh, in the regions and the foreign exchange that the country uh, desperately needs. Um, and then I think there are also industries that we need to look to, uh, the sunrise industries, the industries where there's, we believe there's untapped economic value um, to where we can realize new markets, new products, uh, raise productivity uh, and grow uh, our prosperity. Um, we also need to take a regional cut on this. I think that the, when you look around New Zealand, regions are uh, feeling the effects in different ways. So that's a very important lens as well. Uh, and the other uh, thing I think it's important to think of in this respect also is um, the effects on the labour market. When you think about the, the, the massive level of economic disruption caused by COVID-19 uh, and the loss of jobs and tourism, and export education uh, and hospitality. Uh, this is uh, going to be a very, very tough year for those workers, their families, the entrepreneurs, the business owners, the investors. And uh, we've got to uh, uh, be thinking about uh, how, we can, how we can grapple in a very creative way and deliberate way with what will be a doubling uh, or more of unemployment. And so that, I think, um, really begs the question about active labour market policies. How do we help uh, speed the transition of, um, for people from one job or one, one firm or one industry to another? Um, and the fourth uh, point uh, that I wanted to make is that as well as um, uh, when we're thinking about infrastructure, as well as ramping up uh, the work uh, and the, the volume of work and building this uh, great pipeline, we shouldn't lose sight of the challenge uh, that I have um, uh, had many fruitful discussions with um, the members of Infrastructure in New Zealand uh, about over the last few years. And that is the challenge to be smarter and more innovative 
in the way that we think and plan and, and invest and deliver uh, our infrastructure. And so I think it, um, with this industry, that means things like reforming the planning system, smartening um, the approach to government procurement, uh, tackling the, the, the quite thorny issues around infrastructure funding and financing, um, the relationship between central and local government uh, and how we can uh, make that work better, uh, spatial planning for growth, so much more deliberate and integrated uh, regional planning for growth, uh, tackling the, the productivity problems that bedevil the construction industry, uh, and the, the only other thing I would add to this long list is um, vocational training and workforce development, which is a, um, uh, an area where uh, we have a lot of work to do, but we are already doing uh, a great deal. So Sarah, why don't I leave it there with those few high level comments and uh, I really look forward to hearing what people have to say and, and uh, answering any questions. Look, thank you very much, uh, Minister. You've certainly touched on many of the aspects our members are continually talking to us about. Um, both Paul and I have been talking with all our member organisations over the last few weeks, um, really understanding how they're going at the coalface, what their challenges are, and you know, really what support they're looking for. And certainly some of the things you mentioned uh, are very much top of mind. Minister, we have had a lot of questions come through <laughs> prior to the webinar and right at the moment, just a reminder for webinar attendees, if you would like to pose a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to write uh, your question uh, and we'll try and take as many as we can. But Minister, the first question I have for you, and you did touch on this to some degree, is that our members are very interested in how the government will assess the projects that are coming through the CIP process. What principles or weightings uh, will you place on factors like job creation versus social impacts during and post COVID, um, regional or national priorities, the environment. I certainly know from our Emerging Talent Young Leaders Network, they are very worried because that is the generation that is going to inherit the debt. How are they going to pay for things that they don't even believe in? Minister, how are we going to choose the right projects for the country? So the easy questions first, Sarah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I'm pleased to be able to have a chance to address this. Uh, and I, it's been, uh, there's been a really great public uh, debate and conversation about this over the last few weeks that we really welcome. And I think the, the last point you made, Sarah, is absolutely the right one. Um, our governments, I think, demonstrated our willingness to use the country's balance sheet. You know, we've taken a very conservative approach to debt, not only our government, but successive governments of both main political stripes in this country. And, um, and the rainy day, uh, that is the, ju the justification for that conservative approach to, to debt is well and truly here. But we have to be really aware that it's our kids who are going to be paying this debt off. And so we better darn well be investing in things that equip this country for the 21st century uh, and not for the last one. So um, the first thing to say is that uh, Mark Binns, the um, chair of Crown Infrastructure Partners and the team of advisors that he has assembled have been doing a fantastic job for us. And they've really been out there talking with uh, right across your industry, the construction sector and uh, local government. Uh, and really soliciting, um, you know, we've had, I think, more than 1,700 projects that have been submitted. Uh, one of the factors that we will consider is this, um, the much uh, overworked phrase, shovel ready. Uh, so we're obviously looking for projects that are going to be ready to go in the near term. Minister, can I just interrupt you there? I think shovel ready and shovel worthy. <laughs> is the issue that we may need to be discussing today. You're stealing my best lines. <laughs> I, I, I agree completely. I agree completely. So, but timeliness is one thing. Another is, um, is the, regional, the regional mix of projects. This is a nationwide economic shock that we're experiencing. It's not just something that's combined, uh, confined to the big cities 
uh, we're going to have to um, have a spread of projects throughout the country. Um, uh, the third thing is that um, we are very, very keen on the quality of the stimulus effect. Not all projects, stimulus projects, are created equal. And uh, some have a, a greater multiplier and great wider economic benefits than others. So we're uh, currently the officials are working hard on how we can assess the multiplier effect and the quality of the stimulus. And then finally, and I think this is the thing that you were driving at and much of the public debate has hinged on, will the projects that we invest in reflect our, the, the higher economic goals that we have as a country? And I'm, I'm really hot on this. I think it's absolutely it's critical that we're investing in things that will provide a legacy for our kids and their children. We have to decarbonize the economy. We have to fix the, the housing crisis and the, and the policy and structural causes of it. We, we all know, we are, I think everybody agrees that when we're making big economic decisions and investing in infrastructure, we've got to be thinking about the well-being of our people and our communities. So, um, you know, we've got to fix three waters infrastructure. It's, it's a mess uh, in this country. Uh, our schools and our hospitals need investment. So we're taking that very eclectic approach and projects will be assessed on the degree to which they align with those strategic goals. I'm really encouraged by your answer there, Minister. Um, I think that will give um, people a lot of comfort. So. You, you're sorting out the projects, but our people want to know how you are going to achieve accelerated project delivery. Is that going to include things like accelerated consenting, more alliances or early contractor involvement? Is there a timeline when we might see the first projects that benefit from this project process? How are we going to get these things moving fast? So two things that we're actively working on right now to, um, to achieve that. One is that um, David Parker, who's the Environment Minister and responsible for all things RMA, uh, he's been doing some work, um, which he's, um, we'll be bringing to Cabinet shortly, on whether uh, there are um, approaches that we could take that would speed up the consenting process. Now, um, I think everybody understands and realises that RMA processes take too long. And that's why David's leading a comprehensive RMA reform process to look at the whole system. But we can't wait for that to happen. And so um, we've been taking a hard look at what we can learn from um, the Kaikoura Hurunui post-earthquake legislation uh, and also the Pukiahu National War Memorial Park uh, legislation in Wellington. Both of those, I think, provide really good learning. And elements of those, I, I believe, will form um, a, uh, the basis of some legislation, which we will pass, that will create a framework for much, much faster uh, consenting and RMA uh, processes for, the, for the, um, the COVID recovery stimulus program. Just to give you one other example, I'm responsible for government procurement as a Minister of Economic Development. And um, uh, you often hear grumbles from within the private sector and the industry about how the procurement process slows things down. We're, I've got the officials looking at um, whether we need to adjust the guidelines and the procurement rules. Um, but I think more importantly, how do we change the behaviour of government agencies and departments when they do procurement? And uh, so we're working on both those things. That's music to our ears, Minister. I certainly think there will be many in our, um, our sizable audience today who will be very happy to hear that. Now, Minister, you are across three different portfolios. Uh, a question that we have here. Kayanga Order's proposed powers are well known, but its balance sheet and ability to raise debt may be its secret superpower. How will Kayanga Ora work through the recovery to partner with local councils and private developers to crowd in successful urban developments. Mm. So um, it's, it's a real uh, serendipity, I think, that the work that we've been doing uh, with Kainga Aura to, to create a vehicle that has a, a serious balance sheet and a fully joined up approach to urban development um, uh, will actually be a very useful tool to help us in the, in the post-COVID recovery era. 
and uh, we currently have before Parliament legislation to give it these powers. It's going to have all of the powers that have to this point been the exclusive domain of local government, all brought together in a one-stop shop with a streamlined process to undertake large-scale and complex developments. So um, my hope is that notwithstanding the um, delays in Parliament caused by um, uh, COVID-19, we'll still get that legislation passed well, well in advance of the pre-election shutdown. Uh, and uh, we're already looking at where might be the first projects uh, that could be set up using the urban development legislation. Remember that um, these urban development entities are designed to be joint venture vehicles with private developers, with iwi, with local councils. It's not just the Crown doing all this. But um, I think there's one really critical thing that government has to be mindful of in this period. Uh, an economic shock like this has such a chilling effect on private sector investment. And it's up to government to use all the levers it has at its disposal to try and give confidence to the private sector and to private capital to continue investing, to continue uh, taking on risk and projects. Because the thing that I'm really fearful of is that if we don't do this, if we don't really front foot it and, and, uh, and government doesn't uh, use the levers and doesn't work with the private sector, the risk is that we'll face what happened after the 87 share market crash, uh, the devastation of our productive capacity, and particularly in construction and development and infrastructure. And we saw that again after the GFC. And, um, uh, and I've no doubt that same thing is happening right now. And we've got to, we have to lean into it and use uh, government and local government for that matter too. Use those balance sheets, work with the private sector, make sure projects go ahead and try to um, uh, retain some confidence in the industry. Minister, that's a great segue for our next question. Um, do you have any principles for how private capital could be encouraged to invest for public benefit? Is there a role for an unsolicited bid process, private ownership of infrastructure, or perhaps a framework where the Crown could take some demand risks, as it did with the CIP equity funding of the broadband network to attract private investment? Well, I think that uh, the ultra-fast broadband exercise was um, uh, a really fantastic and successful example of modern infrastructure being rolled out in a way that played to the strengths of both public and private capital. And we should... And and thank goodness it did, Minister, because look at what we're using right now. Yeah, yeah, and we can, that's, that's true, Sarah. Um, as well, those reforms and the unbundling of telecoms monopoly have created one of our fastest growing and most successful new industries, and that's the digital technology sector. So it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful case study of modern infrastructure and policy working hand in hand. Um, I, look, my view on this is that uh, in uh, much of the infrastructure sector, certainly the built environment uh, tr around transport infrastructure, property, housing, and this joined up vision for urban development, that um, it's, the door is absolutely open to private capital uh, working alongside the government. And, uh, uh, and I know that I, I've enjoyed many good discussions with Infrastructure New Zealand members about how we might do this how government can um, make itself available. And, and you know, we've, um, in the Auckland Light Rail project, we've gone out of our way to consider um, a, a really innovative new uh, funding and financing unsolicited bid that was put to us by the Super Fund and their Canadian partners. And I think that, that demonstrates our openness to, um, to doing things differently. I'm, I would love us to get beyond the old business as usual approach where you know, government uses taxpayer money or, and borrows to build transport infrastructure and then comes along to the private sector and says, can you help us um, build it? <laughs> and then lets the, all of the gains, the, the, the uplift in values and the development uh, uplift uh, just kind of ignores them and lets them be frittered away. So I. I would love public and private to work together on some of these big development projects, mm. both investing and owning the assets and getting the long-term uh, return on capital together. 
Uh, Minister, you sit across three portfolios. I'd now like to turn your attention to your transport portfolio. Um, there are many diverse views on how COVID-19 will or won't change transport in New Zealand, with a draft government policy statement out for consultation. How do you ensure the GPS stays relevant when the long-term impacts of this crisis are not yet fully known? Mm. Um, it's it's a, it's a difficult one, Sarah. So. Um, I think we can guess at some immediate, it's very early days, right? But we can guess at some of the immediate effects. Um, our early modeling indicates that um, uh, far fewer vehicle kilometers traveled is gonna mean a sharp drop off in ruck and uh, excise duty revenue, which is how we generate most of the four and a half billion dollars we need every year to keep the transport system ticking over. So um, that's something that we're gonna have to grapple with and uh, we're either going to have to um, borrow money and uh, smooth that over uh, a number of years or get other sources of revenue uh, from the Crown or we'll have to start uh, reprioritising um, our program. So um, the latter option I'm not that keen on, but the, the other first two options are, are fairly challenging. So that's, that's something. The second thing is, how will COVID-19 change the behaviours and the drivers of transport uh, in the economy? We've seen uh, what a devastating effect uh, it's had on aviation. And we've done a lot of work uh, over the last uh, uh, six weeks or so, putting in place uh, first a $600 million assistance package for aviation, working very hard with the, our exporter community and putting in place arrangements uh, with Air New Zealand and a, and a range of other airlines to ensure that not only does New Zealand get high value essential items coming in like medicines, but that our exporters can get their products to their overseas markets. In, in the urban space, for example, uh, what does urban transport look like in a post COVID future? Will people wanna go back to public transport? Uh, we just don't know that at this stage. I, I think they probably, uh, Will, but we're going to have to grapple with uh, all of those things uh, in the in the post-COVID world. Mm. Um, something which has shaken our industry a little bit um, is the possibility of a new New Zealand Department of Works. <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? So. Um, uh, the reportage about that was really the, the, based on the musings of my colleague Shane Jones. Uh, and um, I want to stress that there's been no discussion or consideration of this at Cabinet, so it's not something that's uh, on the government's agenda. But I do want to underline that uh, in this new world, we've got to be willing to think differently. And, uh, and so, for instance, Grant Robertson's asked the question publicly, you know, as we think about the, the post-COVID world, um, what is the role of government in the economy? Um, how do we think about matters of resilience? When we build back uh, the economy, what do we want it to look like? What are the things we should own? What are the things that we need to prioritise uh, investments for? So all those things are up for grabs. But I'll tell you what I am really sh sure about in this respect, and that is that um, if we're serious about tackling um, the, the really difficult and entrenched problems in our urban land and housing markets, for example, um, the government has to have the levers to ensure that it can play its part. That's why um, uh, I set up the, a new Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, because the government had no significant capacity to deal with issues of the housing market um, in its many uh, facets. And it's why we've established Kainga Aura, a kind of delivery agency sitting alongside NZTA uh, as the transport delivery agency, responsible for government partnering with the private sector, running projects, doing development. Uh, and that, that capacity is, is uh, really important because without it, government doesn't have the ability to, to, do, it, to do much of anything at all. I think the question about do we need a Ministry of uh, Works, some kind of uh, boots on the ground, um, multidisciplinary urban development uh, and construction agency, um, 
that's something, you know, maybe that's a debate we should have. I don't know. Well, as long as they don't have to wear their gliding on walk shorts, Minister. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, Minister, you mentioned NZTA and Kayanga Aura. So we understand that NZTA being able to borrow in the same manner as Kayanga Aura uh, may be a possibility to enable them to enter into multi-year funding programs and procurement. Is this one of the options you are considering at the moment? It's something that has been discussed um, on and off, and uh, NZTA already has the uh, the power to um, to borrow for really for cash flow purposes, but there's a limit on it. Um, uh, previous governments, both Labour and national-led governments, have embarked on um, PPPs, which are you know a, a financing arrangement that can spread over 25 or 30 years, uh, and then um, NZTA carries that on its balance sheet and services that debt through the National Land Transport Program. So I'm, I have to say, I'm, um, in general, I'm keen that we all use our balance sheets, government balance sheets, local government, private sector, uh, as seriously as we can to support the growth and development that the country needs. And, uh, you know, we've significantly increased Kainga Aura's borrowing capacity, so it can roll out the public housing build program. Uh, and I'm certainly not averse to the idea that, that we should use NZTA's um, balance sheet in the same way. The question is a little bit academic, given that um, if you look at crown debt overall, um, we've demonstrated in the face of this economic shock uh, that we are willing to seriously uh, mobilise the crown's balance sheet. And the Reserve Bank, I think, also has moved um, farther in, in the last few weeks than anyone would have thought was likely six months ago. Minister, you have touched on this earlier, um, but skill shortages. Skill shortages um, have been an issue for the industry. Um, and if the government is hoping to both accelerate existing projects and start more projects, um, and our border is essentially closed, uh, making it really difficult for talent to come in, um, how can we deliver these high quality programs of work um, in this new lockdown environment? What, what's, your, what's your solution to this problem? So this is one of those uh, problems that we've um, really been grappling with as a country uh, before COVID and now it's even more urgent. If we want infrastructure and development to play a crucial role in pulling us out of the economic swamp, then we're going to have to have the workforce to do to do that. Uh, it's it's one of the reasons why my colleague Chris Hipkins has been leading this uh, massive reform project of our of voc uh, vocational training and polytech sector that was more or less bankrupt and on its knees and uh, and and simply not doing the job that the country needs it to do. And that is work closely with employers and industries and uh, take a tailored approach in the in the regions. To, to grow the workforce that we need. And so the establishment of the um, New Zealand Institute of Skills and Training with workforce development councils and uh, uh, really good regional presence, very tight collaboration with uh, employers on an industry by industry basis. This is, honestly, I think this is one of the biggest, will be one of the biggest legacies of uh, this term of our government. Um, and it's critically important now uh, moving forward. The other thing to say about that, Sarah, is that um, we've, we've tried really hard to uh, step up to the challenge that the industry put before us, and that was to create this multi-year pipeline, a decade of work at scale, so that firms have the ability to plan, to grow their workforce, build their capability. And, uh, and I think with the National Land Transport Programme, with the New Zealand upgrade, uh, $12 billion commitment, and the, the COVID recovery program that we're working on, we're well on the way to, to providing that, I think. One final question for you, Minister, before we head over um, to Paul. Um, so with this large investment under the stimulus package, how do we avoid a boom bust scenario over the next few years? Um, Look, I should probably also take this opportunity in answering this question to, to um, uh, try to temper some of the expectations about the size of 
um, the uh, COVID stimulus uh, program. Um, uh, notwithstanding our, our seriousness about using the Crown balance sheet uh, to stimulate the economy, um, it, it won't be an unlimited pot of money. Um, and, this, um, and that's just for the common sense reasons that, um, you know, we have to pay this debt back one day. Um, but the other thing is also capability. And there's already a lot of work on. Uh, and um, so we have to be mindful of how much we're loading onto the industry. On the other hand, we need the infrastructure and development industry to help us uh, soak up and deploy a lot of the labour that will be displaced by um, the, the economic shock in a range of other industries. So it's going to be quite, um, quite a balancing act. Thank you, Minister. Um, you've done really well with my mean grilling. I appreciate your honesty um, and, you know, direct answers to a lot of those questions. Look, I'd now like to head across to the Chief Executive of Infrastructure New Zealand, Paul Blair, uh, to provide a summary of today's content and outline the next steps for the industry. Thank you, Paul. Across to you. I get the easy job here, uh, Minister and, and Sarah. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's always fantastic to have a minister come on and be prepared to be so open with us. And I think that um, I'm hoping that this uh, webinar will give some comfort about how you're going through this complex process and how you're sort of trying to keep, I suppose, the strategic balanced with the immediate. Um, we've tried uh, to think about how we would approach this problem and I don't think we have the answers and we've had the benefit of um, talking to pretty much all of our members in the last little while. Um, I love the idea that you're open to what the role of, the go of government, of business and other institutions are in this rebuild. And I think that's an overwhelming uh, message that we've had from our members is they're really keen to help, but they're trying to find their place that they can engage with government and others to put shoulder to the wheel. So um, particularly in that private sector side, so in construction, it's 80% of the construction sector is, is private side. How and where, uh, for what outcomes do we engage with you in order to put our balance sheets to work? Um, really encouraged though by some of the, the things that you've mentioned. So what I thought I'd do is um, uh, also, sorry, the fin finally the link, I suppose, between the economy and infrastructure investment. A bit of a theme and a bit of a worry for the infrastructure sector is, is that a number of people have shorthanded that to people pushing dirt around in big yellow tractors. Um, that is one definition of infrastructure, but really what we should be talking about is the platform for our future well-being. You know, so um, we all undervalued, I would think, the social uh, part of those four well-beings and look at where we are now. It is the environmental side. It is also um, the culture and the community that we want to be in, as well as the economy. So um, I thought I'd finish on um, some themes that Sarah and I have been hearing um, when we've been talking to our members. So um, a key one has been, uh, you know, we had a, an event in both Christchurch and Kaikoura that really um, quite literally shook the country. Uh, we need to use those learnings um, in terms of how to rapidly deploy. Uh, and I'm really encouraged that it's, it's, at least from your perspective, not about reintroducing the status quo. Um, I think we missed an opportunity in Christchurch and this is going to be a very expensive uh, period for New Zealand. We've got to, got to go hard. I think there is a balance between um, programs of work and projects. And so uh, one thing that Infrastructure New Zealand has been advocating is that there are probably some no regrets projects that will come through the CIP piece. But equally, we would love to see those rolled very quickly into programs of work that have a strategic focus, enable us to invest you know, for that long term that you've just talked about, um, but also make sure that we work um, much more collaboratively. There is a real risk that we overinvest in projects and are busy being busy, but don't get great outcomes. Sustainability and quality of outcomes and also response to climate change is something that you've touched on, but it, we hear it again and again and again. Um, and I think that those core values that you talk about that are in your government are actually um, shared by a lot of uh, the New Zealand members that we have and, and some of the international members as well. So I'd love to see those brought to the fore in a framework that we could all see and, and measure against. I think we've underappreciated resilience in the past in this country. We haven't really invested in it. Um, and resilience um, means that we need to be thinking forward about those future events, planning for it and investing for it as well. 
Uh, we hear time and again that um, the wellbeing framework is an excellent one, but really we've got some sharp relief around the economic side of it and not so much around those other three wellbeings. Um, this pandemic has meant from a public health perspective, we've had to go into some quite uncomfortable things about valuing lives, whether explicitly or implicitly. Um, we're going to need to be with Treasury some very sharp in terms of the things that we value that aren't monetary in the social, the cultural and the environment, and they need to be brought to the fore. Uh, representation from, from youth, from iwi, from diverse voices that aren't necessary at the table is a really strong push from our members. Uh, so as you're thinking about those delivery vehicles, where is the seat at the table uh, and where are those diverse voices able to attach? Um, I love that you've focused on innovation. I think that is a key and I think um, great role for the government in removing red tape and barriers to provide the confidence, particularly for private sector, but also for local government, uh, for iwi and for other community investors um, to, to bring their money to the fore. Um, speed to decision is, is obviously critical. And um, you know, so the type of delivery vehicle that you choose is, is critical. Um, and I think that uh, you've got the right balance between wanting to control, but also you need to devolve. And if you devolve, uh, provided you're clear on outcomes, you're going to get a lot, a lot better outcomes. Um, clarity on New Zealand's competitive and comparative advantages. There's a lot of discussion about that wide blue moat, about the fact that we're going to be um, one, of the, one of the countries that's got um, you know, a, a fantastic record of leadership uh, and that we've come out and that we will be a, a highly attractive place in the world. Um, there are some, some theories out there about immigration. I think that we potentially sell our citizenship a bit too cheaply. There are some proposals out there. Um, I think that we should think about the skills that we want to import because I think that we're going to have an ability in the world to be a pretty special place, even more special and rare than we are now. And we should uh, have a discussion about that and actually uh, have a population policy. We do not have one at present and it's really a huge tool that we've got and finally, um, the thing that I hear again and again, and we've moved really rapidly, but um, we would love to see transparency of these decision frameworks. Uh, and I think that they can really only be principles um, because things are moving fast. Um, but, you know, it is a great piece of work to have some of the things that you've mentioned, at least on paper. We may not have the weights, but we do need to see that. And I think that having that discussion and that push and pull is really, really important. So. Uh, Minister, that's um, a huge amount that you've got through in, in a short period of time. Uh, we won't have got through all of the questions and answers, but I really do thank you for your contribution today, and I'll hand back to Sarah. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. We are right on time. Um, we appreciate that times are frantic and stressful and that you are very possibly Zoomed out, um, but we do appreciate you for joining us today. Minister, thank you for presenting to our members. Um, I'm sure you're in back-to-back -back Zoom calls as well, uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'd like to make a quick shout out to the Infrastructure New Zealand team. Um, a quick hi for you from everybody behind the scenes um, who is joining and supporting uh, the Zoom call today, uh, particularly to Sally Bunce, Tara Daly and Lennart. Thank you for your behind the scenes work. So people, that brings today's session to a close. Please stay tuned uh, for the next details of our webinar. If you have any comments uh, or questions, please reach out to Paul or myself. Our contact details are listed on our website. And as I mentioned earlier, all our webinars are recorded and posted on our website too. Everybody have a relaxing Anzac weekend before we leap into level three and the gradual lifting of the lockdown next week. Kia kaha, stay safe. Minister, once again, thanks very much. Good afternoon. Bye, bye.